Okay, ladies. Would you believe it? At the last session of Breathe and only two more studies in this season before we take a break for the summer. So let's, uh, in summer, what a lovely sound that it has right now on this snowy day. So let's pray and we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you, your, your goodness lasts and extends throughout all seasons and all generations, all seasons of the year, all seasons of our lives, that we can look back and say you have been faithful. You've been so faithful. And we thank you for that, and we just pray that you would be faithful once again and that you would open our eyes this morning to truths from your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, I ask you to look at 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, <laughs> plus a little uh, piece from the Gospel of John. And when you got down to the uh, filling in the blank, there's a word that occurs in the opening phrase of both 1st John and the Gospel of John. And what is that word? Beginning. Beginning. In the beginning, way back before there was anything but God. Jesus Christ existed, and I'm writing about this one. In the beginning was the Word. And then what phrase is repeated twice in 1 John and then the second half of John 1, 14? We have seen. We have seen. He uses other verbs as well. We have heard. And then the kind of strange one, at least I thought it was strange, our hands have handled. Now, when you talk about people that you know or that you've met, do you say, yeah, my hands have handled him or her? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's just not something we say. Sarah said last night, well, I guess I could say that, you know, when I'm giving massages. <laughs> and so he's taking care of little babies, you know, your hands handle them, you know. But that's not normally something we say. We might say, I know him by sight. You know, my eyes have seen him. But we wouldn't say my hands have handled him. But that does have significance, so we'll come back to that in a little bit. Okay, but that phrase was on his mind in the gospel, and also years later when he wrote this little tract, if you will, First John. Okay, um, and then I ask you to do some comparison between Second and Third John. So what is similar about the opening phrase in these two letters? Is that the one where you try to talk face to face? And That's the beginning. Right? That's at the end. Yeah, but in the opening phrase, how no. does he describe himself? Love and truth. An elder. He calls himself an elder. You know, Paul, when he writes his letter, says Paul, an apostle, da 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 da. And Peter says Peter. He just says the elder. You know, he doesn't mention himself by name there. So he refers to himself as the elder. And then did you notice he writes not to churches, but to specific individuals. Now maybe he, he, well not maybe, he probably intended for this letter to be read to the church that they attended, or perhaps even hosted. But he addresses Gaius and then this beloved lady, whoever she was. And then, uh, yes, he says to both of them, I love you in truth. Truth. And that was a big theme that you circled several times. And actually, I even circled it. It's actually his theme in everything that he writes. He talks about the truth. If you look down at the bottom, uh, the last sentence from John that's quoted on this thing, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory as of the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John was concerned about truth. And in fact, so was Jesus Christ. Remember when he met the woman at the well. And as their conversation continued and she was beginning to understand more and more about who she was actually talking to. And he said that God is looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus Christ is the truth and he's concerned about the truth. And John is concerned about a very particular truth that we're going to come to in just a little bit. Okay, now we get down to the ending. And yes, buddy, this is, this is where he told both of them he wanted to see them face to face. He said, I have a lot to say, 
but I don't want to write it down. Now, why is that? Because if the Romans saw it, they would kill him? Well, they didn't want any other where is John when he's writing these epistles? Is he Patmos? Yeah, where he's a he prisoner. Writing? He's on this island, but it was, a, it was like, a, what, what is it, Sing Sing? What's that thing off the coast of the, you know, Alcatraz? Alcatraz, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's like Alcatraz. It's on an island, but it's a prison, you know. And you're right. If this letter falls into the wrong hands, he may be having his beloved Gaius joining him in prison. So I think this was kind of maybe a dangerous time. So I, I'm not dogmatic about that, but there was some reason why he wasn't wanting to write down a lot, but he said, I hope to see you face to face. All right, so that brings us to some things I want to come back to, and I've given you a new sheet. It's the one that has the blue uh, rectangle at the top. So here's, when you read the um, article in the <clears throat> Know Your Bible, it told you, I think it was in, under Second John, that John was writing to deal with what he calls a strange heresy. And so let's look at that. The authors of the Know Your Bible booklet say, quote, First John tackles a strange heresy that claimed that Jesus had been on earth only in spirit, not in body. Okay, well, it does seem strange to claim that Jesus Christ never had a physical body, but is it really a heresy to say that? So I looked up heresy, and it's defined as the rejection of a belief that is part of church doctrine. Now, is the belief that Jesus had a body a part of our doctrine, of our teaching? Absolutely. Absolutely. Every New Testament writer portrays Jesus as a real human being with a real, tangible, physical body that could, as John put it, be touched and handled, which our hands have handled. I can't grab hold of a ghost, a spirit, I handle his body. I know he had a body. So to say that he's just a spirit that looked like a man but really wasn't would indeed be heresy. That goes against everything that we're taught. But, okay, but does that belief really matter? I mean, John certainly seemed to think it mattered. In his first letter, John says, Dear friends, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to determine if they're from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world, and this is how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit who confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh, he had a body, is from God. But every spirit who does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh, if they are not teaching that Jesus had a body, they're not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. That is pretty strong language. And then he wrote just as strongly in his second letter. He says to this beloved, gay, or to the beloved lady, I guess it is, many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, those who are saying he didn't have a body. Such a one is a deceiver and the antichrist. Everyone who goes ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. What was the teaching of Christ? Remember the Last Supper? He took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is, this is my body, which is broken for you. He took the wine and he said, this is my blood, which is poured out in sacrifice for you. This is the teaching of Jesus Christ himself. So if, if anyone comes to you and doesn't bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Don't give him any greeting for anyone that greets him takes part in his wicked works. John is very strong on this. So now my question is, why is John so adamant? What is the problem with teaching that Jesus didn't have a real physical body? He absolutely would not be redeemed from our sin. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Spot on. It took, without the remission of Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. He came to be our sacrifice. So to teach that he had a didn't have a body, he says, 
there was no sacrifice. You are still in your sins. And what was John's passion? He wanted people to believe. What did he say about his gospel? These things have been written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and by believing have life. And why did he write 1 John? Down at the bottom of the page here. 1 John says, these things have I written that you may know that you have eternal life. Yes, it is absolutely essential that we know that Jesus Christ had a body that was broken for us. I thought again, um, you know, we think at Christmas time, we always get kind of warm and sentimental, and we see these, love, these Christmas cards with Mary holding her little baby, you know. But Simeon says, okay, Mary, reality check. A sword's going to pierce your soul. This baby's going to die. You know, it, it, God wasn't being sentimental when he sent that baby. He had a big purpose in mind for that child. So it's not that we don't enjoy Christmas, but we have to remember there was a purpose in him coming and taking on a body. Um, okay. Now, I just want to make one other comparison between the book of John, the Gospel of John, and 1 John. Um, I tend to think of the Gospel of John as a book, and 1 John as more of a booklet or maybe even a tract. The Gospel of John was written primarily to unbelievers, trying to give them very convincing proof and evidence that Jesus was God, and that he did provide a way for them to be redeemed from their sins. He said, I, I want you to become believers. Well, now in 1 John, he's writing to believers, but he wants to give them assurance of their salvation. Um, if you've believed, then I want you to know that you have eternal life, you know? And I remember a time in my life when that was right after I became a believer, I was 17, and I think I shared with you earlier that um, I had become a believer by taking a tract up to my room and reading it through. And I just remember kneeling by my bed. I wasn't even praying. I was just, uh, you know, the, the relief that just, you know, I, it was almost like I could physically feel that burden of sin rolling off of me, you know. So that was great for a few weeks. And then we had a guest speaker come to our church and he was talking, you know, urging people to ask Jesus into their heart, you know, to save them from their sins. I thought, I didn't ask Jesus to come into my heart. I just, you know, I just read that tract and I believed it, you know. And so I had doubts, you know, am, am I a Christian or not? You know, what, what does it mean to ask Jesus, you know, into your heart? So I met with my pastor and he took me to 1 John 5.13 and read that, you know. Have you believed? You know, these things. I said, yes, you know. And he said, well, then according to 1 John, you have eternal life, you know. So sometimes we need to be careful how we phrase coming to faith, you know. But anyway, that was John's purpose. Okay, I know you're believers, and I, I just want you to have that assurance that you may know that you have eternal life. You're not going to have any doubts about it at all. All right, so... That brings us to the next, to the last book, <laughs> Jude. And you have a whole packet that I gave you. And that's partly because you have no more book assignments. So I provided you with a little book of my own um, to prepare you for the DVD we're going to see. And the whole premise of the DVD is that Jesus was a Galilean and his disciples were Galilean. And there were significant things that they believed that or they would have known that other people did not. So I've given you a three pages, two, two sheets, front and the back on the first page, but anyhow, up with quotes from the New Testament. And I'm going to have you circle Galilee or Galilean every time you see it. And you're going to see it's amazing how often that comes up. And I'm also having you draw a little blue box around all the towns in Galilee. I've given you names of them, four specific ones that are mentioned in the excerpts I've given you. And then I've also given you a map that I think is very helpful um, so that you can see where Galilee, where all these towns were, 
and then a little separate map there that shows how many of those familiar stories, like the Sermon on the Mount, the feeding of the 5,000, how many of them took place in or around the Sea of Galilee. So anyway, so that hopefully will be kind of an interesting thing for you to do to get ready for the DVD. And then the other one is, of course, on Jude. So um, I've given you marking assignments for both sets of printouts there for next week. Okay. Could I give you a quick praise? Yeah. I heard it on TV this morning. They said um, children between the ages of, or people between the ages of 18 and 25, there's a 33% increase in um, them worrying about their faith and having revivals. And so, so 33%, that's a lot. It's a lot. And may God give us eyes to see those people around us and opportunities to share and, and protect them from false. Yes, because of many that. false prophets. Because, and out. not to put a damper on that, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, but there will are people sometimes that maybe are more motivated than those of us that claim a more fundamental belief mm -hmm. that might take advantage mm -hmm. of people who are emotionally worked up. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think there are some true revivals going on, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's, I, yeah, I've seen, I, I was reading a news story too about, you know, different ones taking place across our country and even other countries, but just, you know, it just really weighed heavily on me though to pray about who is spearheading yeah. those right. revivals. I didn't think about that, mm -hmm. but, yeah. but, uh, but God can um, use, God can use imperfect circumstances. Oh yeah. Still. Yeah. Because even if the heart of whatever they're involved in isn't maybe 100% aligned with the Word of God, if then they seek a church and want to get, you know, that could get them, you know, on the right path. So, mm -hmm. But yeah, I had heard that too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a good thing to be excited for and then pray for. <laughs> yeah, right, right. about you, but I have been enjoying my 14 minutes and my 14 inches. I told the ladies last night, actually, one day it was four square inches of space, but I was so pleased. I had it's the top drawer of my jewelry box, and I had a box in there that had safety pins. Well, they were all mixed up, you know, this ones and the little ones and longer ones and so on. So always, it seemed like the one that I wanted, I was, so okay. So I found myself some other little boxes. So now all the ones that are about that long are in one box, and the ones that are about this long are in another box, and the itty bitty ones. So I could just reach in there, grab one. And I yes. <laughs> you know, so my four square inches gave me every much satisfaction as mm -hmm. the bigger ones, you know. But anyway, this has been a good week, and I appreciate it. The things that she had to say, and I love her wrap up. So. Um, Let's just kind of go through that, and I'll point out. Where did my sheet go? There it is. Oh, you know what I found very interesting. What? I never put it together like that. Oh, that um, creation? Yeah. When he did the day and night, you had to have this, and for the heavens and oceans, you had to have a place for the fish. And right. I, I, wow. <laughs> so isn't that true? He, first he prepares the place. And then he fills it. And what did Jesus say? I go to prepare a place for you. And then he'll bring us to that place. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. That was very interesting to see how that that worked. So let's just go through. I'm just going to tell you some things that hit me. And if we go past something that hit you, feel free to wave your hand. And <laughs> we'll, we'll stop and talk about it. Okay. Uh, on page 92 and 93, what hit me was uh, the last sentence in these double brackets down on the bottom, page 92, where he says, "I, God is speaking to Pharaoh. He says, look, God, <laughs> you know, I've let you live 
for this purpose, meaning I could have taken you out anytime I chose. I have let you live for this purpose, to show you my power and to make my name known in all the earth. And I thought, really, that has been God's two big purposes in everything that he's ever done, is to show his power. When he created those heavens and filled them with stars, does that not show his power? You know, and and to magnify his name, that his name might be great in all the earth. Um, that's always been his his purpose in anything that he's done. Um, and that, that he says that sometimes in another way, uh, a phrase that's used quite frequently in the Old Testament is, "I'm going to do such and such, and then you will know that I am the Lord, and then you will know." me. God wants us to know him. The next thing that struck me was on page 94, and I love this. It's the second sentence, or the second paragraph on the page. The Sabbath day was the occasion designed to give room for gratitude to swell into worship. And what a lovely way to say it. You know, we'll look back over the six days and see all that he's provided. And then you're grateful for it. And then maybe you burst into song. Whatever you do, however your heart, you know, expresses your worship. But that's what the Sabbath is for. Take the moment to stop and pause, reflect on him, and then just let that flow out of you in worship. So how do you think that the Sabbath specifically helped and encouraged the Israelites in worshiping Yahweh. Any thoughts on that one? Hopefully they looked back and saw all the times that God has been willing to forgive and give them blessings again, repeatedly, mm -hmm. even when they were disobedient, even when they were, you know, willfully that way. Mm -hmm. He still forgave and he gave them, took care of their needs. Mm -hmm. I think we do the same thing, you know, oh, well, I got that done. Well, no, you really didn't get it done. God got it done. But, yeah, it's easy to just accept all his blessings and not thank mm -hmm. him. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, really yeah. be grateful. Force them to be intentional, too, about it, which, uh -huh. you know, so much in our world, we feel like feelings of gratitude or love or this or that actually just happen. And... You know, we're talking about like love being a choice, you know, and so many people, it's amazing how many people are like, love isn't a choice, you can't help who you love, you know. If you've been married to anyone for a long time, you know love is a choice, because there are days we are all very unlovable. Mm -hmm. Well, worship's a choice, mm -hmm. and forcing that boundary, mm -hmm. you know, and there's nothing else they could do mm -hmm. that they were allowed to do by the law, mm -hmm. you know, I think it made it an intentional thing where they were, Mm -hmm. You know, what else are we going to do? But we've been told we stop, we do this, you know, mm -hmm. we intentionally choose to come to church on Sundays. We intentionally choose to carve out that time. You know, the, the thing about physically, the muscles have memory. Mm -hmm. You've heard that saying. And I think spiritual muscles have memory too. And sometimes we force ourselves to do the right thing even when we don't feel like it. Because then the feelings will follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They follow obedience. But I'm thinking about the Israelites. You realize they saw a miracle every single week because on that sixth day they got double manna and any other day if they had extra it would have rotted mm -hmm. but every week they saw that the sixth day the friday manna kept for two whole days and they you know i don't know if they experimented from time to time and got a little extra and sure enough it rotted you know throughout the week but they saw that miracle every week and i think too did they ever lack for food no now maybe they got tired of manna but they never the bible, lacked for it yes i thought the bible said it was very tasty well it was <laughs> like a but, dessert to begin with <laughs> but maybe if i had banana pudding which i love every day for four oh, yeah. years and that was all i had <laughs> you know, maybe I would have longed for a steak or something, you know, something along the way. Anyway. But it's better to be full of something. Right, exactly. Enough. But knowing human nature, I'm sure they got tired of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But nonetheless, that's how we are. <laughs> they were in the middle of the wilderness, and yet God provided 
food. Mm -hmm. So they had, if they had eyes to see, and some of them did, you know, that could swell up them into worship because that's really what God intended. Not just to stop, but to stop for a purpose. Develop your relationship with me. You know, I love you. I provide for you. I want to talk to you. I want to, I want to have a relationship with you. I want to hear your voice talking to me. You know, I don't want this all to be a one-way thing. I, I want a response from you. So, okay. And then I like, <laughs> just across the page from that, uh, the guy that she calls pastor, author, and my dear old dad, Tony Evans, defines worship this way. And I really like this. I thought it was a very practical thing. Worship is recognizing God for who he is, recognizing him for what he's done on our behalf, and then recognizing or what you are expecting him to do in the future with confidence. You have that confident expectation. And any of those things, if you take the time to do them, like if we just stop now, just tell me, what are some of the characteristics of God? What is God like? All-knowing. All-knowing. All-powerful. All-powerful. Perfectly good. Okay, anybody else? <laughs> Bonnie's on a roll here. <laughs> Faithful. Forgiving. Forgiving. Loving. Loving. And he gives grace. Yes. Yeah. Merciful. Yeah. Wonderful, merciful, yeah. safe. But also just. Just. Mm -hmm. And as we go, you the more you think about who he is, the more you want to praise him mm -hmm. for that. Same thing. If we started a list of what are some things that God has recently done on your behalf. You know, as we think about those things and share them, again, it begins to well up into worship. And then what are we expecting God to do? Saying, God, I know we're seeing that all these young people have this feeling of the void in their life and wanting faith. Then I expect that God is going to do something about that. And we can be praying, you know, with expectation and then be looking for it. Are we going to begin to see some of that age group trickling into our church? And I think we have seen some of the that age group, but maybe there'd be more coming in there. I would ask God to do that. But anyway, I just thought this was a very practical thing, because sometimes when you think about worship, it can be kind of a fuzzy, you know, what do you do? Not everybody sings, you know? So, but this, thinking about who he is, and thinking about what God has done, and thinking about what he's going to do, and he's still active, you know? Um, just, it's very helpful. So then we come to the next page, 96, and she had Psalm 147, and in the big bold brackets there, and she asked that we, if there's anything that kind of struck us to highlight those portions, and then to use those portions to kind of construct your own words of worship. And something that uh, hit me was actually the in the bottom paragraph, I highlighted the praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises, and how pleasant and fitting to praise him. But then if you look at the rest of that, it's talking about things that God has done. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. And I thought, and you know what? He's building up my rest, my dwelling place. He's given Tom and me a nice house, and he's helping us with it. And he is preparing a place for me in heaven. You know, the, the heavenly Jerusalem. And then it says, he gathers the exiles of Israel. And I thought that's something else that God is good at, taking people who are estranged and bringing them back and giving them <coughs> acceptance. They're no longer exiles. They're part of the family. He brings them back home, you might say. That's a work of God. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And I thought he... He cares not only about our hearts, but our bodies. You know, he heals our broken bodies and heals our broken hearts. And then it says, and this one just always blows me away. He determines, not only knows, but he determines the number of the stars. And he calls them each by name. Now that's amazed me for years. But now you see these new images from the James Webb telescope 
And you see these things, you see all these dots in the dark sky, and you think, oh, that's a starry night. And then they say, no, 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 no. Each one of those dots, that's a galaxy. <coughs> that's a galaxy, that's a galaxy. They aren't stars, those are galaxies. How many stars are in a galaxy? Ladies, we don't even have a name for a number that big. There is no way we can wrap our minds around how many stars that is. And God not only determines how many there are, he knows each one of them so well. He knows what's unique about it, and he gives them a name. This one is redder than any other star in the universe. I'm going to call him Rosie. See, I don't think he gives them names like A36. You know, I think he gives them names that relate to something about them. What does Revelation tell us? He's going to give each one of us a new name. And it's going to be something, I think, that relates very specifically and individually to who we are. Something that he treasures about us. And he's going to give you a name. You know, he looks at the stars and he calls them each by name. Whoa. Isn't it <laughs> funny how many things lately have tied in perfectly with what I would be teaching in our Sunday class to the little kids? And like, I swear, like we do Sunday school and we're like two semesters behind, so we're doing stuff from 22. Oh, okay. And like then they go up to church and they talk about, we did creation this last oh, okay. Sunday. Okay. And the, the whole thing, one of the hands-on activities for the kids was to have them as quickly as they name, they could write as many names for stars as possible. And then be like, can you imagine, you know, on one day he created them all and then and he knew them all by name, you know. And it, so it's just so funny you say that. It's like I keep getting reminded of the same things, which goes to show that I need the lesson as much as you yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I just, you know, when you just take the Sabbath minute to mm -hmm. stop and reflect on things like that, it does. <laughs> you can't help but worship mm -hmm. a God that can do that. You know, wow. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's see. Then on the, uh, let's see. What is the next? Oh, yeah. Across the page, she starts another psalm. And when you turn the page to page 98, uh, for years, I have liked verses 12 and 14. It says, the righteous thrive like a palm tree and grow like a cedar tree in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they thrive in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age, healthy and green. And so when I was in my 30s, I did this cross stitch of those verses because I've always liked Boston Burns. So and here I am now in my 70s. <laughs> you know. But um, yeah, it's, it's just good to be reminded of God's word in various ways. Um, so I, I liked that she gave us some scripture to stop and think about and to chew on and to reflect upon. Across the page from there, on page 99, filling in the blanks, it says that in the top psalm says, delight yourself in the Lord. And then the next one down in the next bracket says, call the Sabbath a delight, and then you will take delight in the Lord. So it's just showing that first we're delight in the Lord, and then we delight in the Sabbath, which will cause us to delight in the Lord. And um, and I, I think, so we've kind of answered how might considering the Sabbath a delight lead to our enhanced delighting in the Lord. Well, again, I'm so excited that I had this minute to stop and think about God. And then as we think about God, it just, we're delighted to think he's can name all those stars and he can heal a broken heart and so on. Okay, then on page 100, she kind of turns it around the other way and asks a couple of questions. And she says, how do you think that neglecting the Sabbath, neglecting the space and time, not taking the time to honor him, how might that invite the growth of other sin into our lives? We have all that open time in to, if you don't have schedule, uh, and it just opens the spaces for Satan, I think, to just move in and tempt you to do something that God doesn't want you to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And we, again, we don't use our time wisely and correctly and fill it with things of the Lord. And I might repeat what you said. I was distracted for a second. Obviously, other we make space for other things to creep in. Yeah. But I mean, I think of when COVID happened, and we were missing so much, you know, church. And I know our church in Sterling Heights did the online. Mm -hmm. But there are people that do better with that. We did not do well with that. Mm -hmm. It's just so easy to be distracted, you know. Mm -hmm. we, we started we started wearing our church clothes the first Sunday, and then jeans the next Sunday, and then pajamas the third Sunday, <laughs> yeah. and then you know kids can't stay awake because mm -hmm. they just rolled out of bed and they're still in their PJs. And um, anyway, all that to say, it was it felt like the hugest void, mm -hmm. and it's easy to get discouraged. And when you get discouraged, Satan goes, "Ha ha, I have an end." Yeah. So. And I think, what is the first and greatest commandment? Love one another. There's one above that. Love the Lord your God. God. And the second one is like to this, yes. that you love your neighbor as yourself. Sorry, but, I that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. So if we're breaking that first commandment, you know, if we're not loving God with this space in our time or with this space in our space, then we're loving something else, you know. Or we're thinking about something else, and then that will just lead us, you know. Big sin never starts big; mm -hmm. it always starts little. And when you and you neglect a garden, what's going to happen? The weeds grow up, mm -hmm. and then they take over, mm -hmm. and then you really have a job <clears throat> on your hands. So yeah, it's just that not honoring the Sabbath just opens the door for so many other things that you're not aware of, maybe. Um, Okay, and then we come to, yeah, this chart that uh, Bonnie saw, and I thought it was neat. And I think the way she structured it, did any of you uh, write anything in the blank under day seven? God's Sabbath. Okay. I, I missed that blank at first, and I didn't see it until yesterday morning when I was going back through and kind of refreshing stuff to get it in my mind. And I, I even just put God up there. And I think that relates across the page in this uh, kind of highlighted thing. She has a sentence that <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little hard to get your mind around at first. It's the, the rising chain of command. You're thinking, what on earth is she talking about? Well, if you look back over here, you know, at the way she's got it structured, and on day one, two, three, God created environments, if you will. And then on days four through six, he began to fill those things. But when he talks about the sun and moon, that he actually says he created the sun to rule the day and the moon to rule the night. You kind of get that chain of command uh, terminology there, You're talking about ruling something. Okay, on day five, he creates the birds and the fish and he tells them so that they'll fill the sky and the oceans. Okay, well, if you are filling something, you're taking possession of the territory. That again kind of has this idea of controlling it, of ruling it in a sense. And then he created land animals, and again, he gave that same thing be fruitful and multiply and fill the land. Take possession of what I have created for you to enjoy. So we have this kind of rising chain of command, if you will, that each one was to command its specific environment. And then you come down to man. And what did God say to man? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So in that sense, they're like the animals. Do the same thing. God is pleased when you fill the earth. But he also says, rule over the animals and the fish and the birds. Chain of command. You're over, they're kind of controlling the land, but you're over them. I want you. And when we or when mankind properly takes care of our habitat and properly takes care of the land and, or the plants and animals within that habitat, we are doing exactly what God wanted when he created man, or at least part of what he wanted. That's a good thing. We are broken. And so we've goofed it up in places, 
uh, last night one of the ladies says, yeah, you know, the people are saying today we have too many humans, you know, give the forest back to their, give this back to this animal, you know, keep the humans out. And I thought, no, 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 that wasn't God's intention. It's just that humans are broken. And yeah, they messed it up. But the answer isn't take humans out of the picture, you know. But, but then you come to day seven, and who's at the very top of this? God. God says, I want to remind you, I am the ruler over all of this. I created it. I created you. I've given you authority to rule in this earth. But I am your ruler. You know, so it's this rising chain of command. Just like a general may give authority to the sergeants and lieutenants under him, but he's still over them. And then you have the commander-in-chief who's over them all. So it's kind of just a neat way to see that chart again and to see how that all fits together. And to think that God is still creating habitats for us. And that he's going to fill it with all of his people. And he comes to take us home. Um, and then on page 109, this thing about the, the definition of chronic, it made me tired just to read it. <laughs> you know, that conditions that last a long time or recur often, they're perpetual, constant, habitual, inveterate. I thought, ooh, that sounds... I looked up inveterate. Inveterate means firmly established over a long period of long standing or deep-rooted, you know, like deep-rooted habits or deep-rooted sins or whatever. And then um, it's, it's also settled into a habit or practice or prejudice. And then, man, you try to get out of it. You get settled into that chair and then, ooh, but standing up, that's the hard part, you know? <laughs> so yeah, um, our chronic, what's chronic in our lives? And he's wanting to make the Sabbath a chronic day. Let that become your new established rhythm of your life. But then I was greatly encouraged when I came to the last page because she talks about the fact, okay, we have good intentions, but all of us have seasons of our lives when there just isn't much room, you know? And, and there's not much you can do about it, you know? Because life happens. And starting in the middle, middle of the page, well, let's just read the whole last page again. A situation that is chronic is habitual and long-lasting. It's not a short-term condition resulting from a new set of circumstances. The word chronic implies a routine that's become ingrained over time into our mindset and into our usual way of living. Now, next paragraph. We do experience other seasons that are just that, seasons. Seasons come and go. And we, hoping that winter goes quickly. <laughs> um, Short-term periods, temporary phases that bring heavier demands on our time and energy than others. In every life, there will come times that require us to fill our spaces and margins beyond those limits by which we have sought to abide. And when this happens, and it will, don't get <coughs> discouraged. Just refocus, reprioritize, get back in step, as you are able, and don't allow yourself to be overcome with a sense of guilt or condemnation. Do not beat yourself up. Just recognize, you know, as chronic overloading doesn't cause us to accumulate brownie points. We're not going to please God by that. But also, short-lived overcrowding doesn't make him mad. You know, it doesn't give his disapproval. He's like He's with us like he was with Hagar in the wilderness. He sees us. He knows our circumstances. He understands and he is compassionate. And he'll be with us until we can get back to the season where we can practice the Sabbath that we want to practice and don't know how or can't do because there's just something that keeps us from it. So I thought those were strong, good words of encouragement. And I think you will find today's uh, video very encouraging. It all takes place at her house. 
is all of you soft or <laughs> have coffee with me. And she talks like she's talking to each one of us one-on-one. -on -one. So 